Oh, the red light is on. Mike. Mike. Roxanne. Mike. What? The red light is on. It no is. one's watching yet, though. See, the number hasn't popped up. The, no, just, the, the, just... it only counts when the number pops up. Yeah, it only Where's works. Where's the number? Oh, the now there's people coming in. To now this there's thing. a number. Now there's a number. My mom's been watching for quite a while. I saw her earlier chatting with me in the, in the, in the feed <laughs> over here. My mom like joined like 75 minutes ago. It was pretty awesome. 80 things. See, you're right, mom. It's episode 80. We've done 80 things, ladies and gentlemen. You know what that means? It's time, Gabe. Roll the clip. Andy Lund, take it away. What time is it? What time is it? It's prime time. It's prime time. What time is it? Well, that would be prime time. Oh, oh yeah. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to Tuesday night. This is episode number 80 of the Primetime Show. Tonight, we're very honored, very happy, and very excited to have guitarist, film producer, author, a man who wears many hats, Mr. Stevie Salas. Hey, welcome, Stevie. Hey. Hey. Good to see you, man. And also tonight, Mr. Tim Godwin will be joining us, along with Mike Venezia and our host of Primetime. Mr. J. Parkin. Wow, it's so good to have you back. It is yeah. so good to have you back, Lund. You've been such a champion sending us all of these fantastic little clips, but man, oh man, it's great to have you here. Andy, good where are you? Fun. I'm in the North Woods tonight, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> He's in the North Woods. Old. We yep. were right last week, yeah. uh, Mike. Yeah, we thought you were in the North Woods, but we didn't know where in the North Woods. But I was, you're in the North not Woods. on the um, on the computers. In you the were North not Woods. on the computers. Okay, no, okay. Ah, uh, Tim Godwin, yes. welcome back to the show. Thanks for it's good to be back, Jay. Yes, <laughs> Tim Godwin's here. I just saw Tim Godwin like an hour ago in a meeting, and then he drove home super fast and jumped on. It was fantastic, Mike Venezia. It's good to see you. I saw you an hour ago, and then you went into a meeting with Tim, and then I raced home really fast, and then I came home. <laughs> and we do it right. We could do this in a studio. Someone said something about budget earlier. We got budget. It's happening. It just takes time over here at yeah. Taylor. We got a lot of guitars coming out. Last week, we had guitars come out. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, we are so excited for this week's guest. It is Stevie Salas. Stevie Salas. Uh, I met Stevie for the first time on a Zoom call with Tim Godwin. Oh. Uh, and we were talking about his uh, the documentary that he produced called Rumble, which we're going to get into in a little bit. It's just uh, a fascinating story. Excellent documentary. You can see it on Netflix right now. I believe it's also on Prime, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, fantastic. Stevie Salas, welcome to the show. Yeah. <laughs> I feel welcome. I feel welcome. You know, it's, I'm, it's, a, it's a San Diego thing, isn't it? Even though I'm not in San Diego right now. Where are you? I'm at, I have a house in Austin, Texas. I'm out here right now. Oh, Austin, Texas. Awesome Texas, as they call it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Miss that oh, place. Texas. Texas. <laughs> I, could be right. back at, I could be back in my spot in Oceanside surfing right now, but I'm here at 49 degrees, Austin, Texas right now. 49 degrees. I got to go to Austin soon. It's 49 degrees there? It's not much warmer yeah. here, so it's not like it's balmy. Oh, I mean, right? it was 65 degrees at least today. Right. That's better. That's better. Man. Well, anyway, Stevie, welcome to prime time. This is such a, this is our guitar nerd talk show. Um, we talk a lot. Some people vibe on that. They don't like it. Some people don't like it. We actually do a few clips in the front or a few segments in the front of the, of the front end of the show. Um, okay, and, wait, 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 wait. Okay, hold on. Why would anybody bother to tune in to a 
guitar company Taylor show that they don't like guitars or guitar nerds. That makes no sense whatsoever. Well, maybe it's the maybe it's the style of the show. The fact that we are not well, you know. We don't have the biggest budget in the world for this, right? But we just make it happen, and it's a good time. It was birthed out of a pandemic. We needed to figure something out, so we came on here, and guess what? 80 things later, you're on the show. We've done this just so that you could be on the show. I told Tim, no way. When you hit 80, call me then. Yeah, see? (laughs) Exactly. He Uh, did. He said that. He did say that. I know. He He did. He said, wait till the 80th. I'm not coming on till the 80th show. All no, right. I, meant, I meant to you gave me 80 guitars is what I meant. Oh. You, mis- you misunderstood me and here I am. Yeah. Oh. Sorry Steve you're cutting sorry Steve you're cutting out. I'm not hearing that all correctly. <laughs> 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 a little interference going on over here. A little bit of interference. Hey, there's some tech issues from here from time to time and that, that yeah. one. Anyway. All right, before we get going, you guys know the deal. Let's keep the feed clean. Let's keep the uh, nerd and guitar nerd. Let's not make this a political show. Except for you're right. The Tiger's hat is better than the Cleveland hat that Gabe's wearing that you guys can't see. He's off camera right now, but I saw him earlier and he's wearing a Cleveland hat. Come on, man. Guardians. Come on. Tigers. <laughs> Tigers all day, and you know it. Anyway, okay, that's about as much. So what I was getting at, is we have a, a segment that we call Hug Your Haters, and that is if somebody, oh, Negus, Joe, Joe Negus is talking. That, look at this. Look at this. There's trash talk already in the peak. <laughs> oh, Cleveland. Okay, fine, Joel. It's fine. Anyway, um, so we – we have a segment called hug your haters and that is if somebody writes us an email or leaves a bad comment we just show them some love we have not been getting hate actually we've been getting a lot of very great emails and so we love that you guys come and hang out with us on a regular basis uh this show is super special to all of us so i think it's i think it's time to get moving the the title of this show is stevie's excellent adventure and you'll get to that in a minute we'll talk about that in a minute but right out of the gate you guys are all doing great. There's no trivia at the end tonight because this is going to be a longer show. Uh, we do a segment called What Are You Listening To? It's very simple, but Stevie, what are a couple of things you've been listening to lately, musically? You know, I hear something weird. Is, is I, in my, I have a gym here in this house, and I decided to get my old boombox out, and I've been listening to... Uh, I, I just all of a sudden started wanting to listen to old early Kiss, the Buzzcocks, Amy Mann, and the Kinks. I think those were my selections of the, been this week, so it's been a little bit bizarre, actually. That's great, actually. Yeah. yeah. There is no trivia, Paul, so you can answer the question tonight. Andy Lund, what have you been listening to? Uh, well, I went down the Jeff Beck thing for a while there. Um, it was weird because, actually, the week, the Saturday before he passed, my brother was here, and we were up late, and we were hanging out, and we were just listening to music and talking about you know, the aging of our idols. And um, he's a little bit younger than I am. And he never really was knew much about Jeff. So and we ended up like listening to an hour and a half of, of stuff. You know, I was calling up stuff on YouTube and putting on vinyl. And and he was like, he's like laser beams. This guy's like laser beams. I'm like, oh, that's a pretty good way to say it, you know. And then three days later, he was gone. So it was it was strange. And I revisited a bunch of stuff this week. Uh, and then I had to stop because I was just, bawling all the time and getting dehydrated oh, oh. So, uh, <laughs> did you uh, did you get did any of you guys ever met jeff before no mm. i haven't he was he was awesome i knew him. i knew him pretty good um you know and uh he um actually me and jimmy dunlap one time had a few cock tequilas in london and we we lied and used his name to get into the groucho club and then we became members and said he was vouching for us and thought for sure that we'd get thrown out. And to our surprise, he vouched for us and we got membership. So, yeah, kudos, <laughs> Jeff, kudos Jeff Beck. Nice. Ah, uh, Jeff Beck. Oh, man. Yeah, that one hit us pretty hard, Lund. I, wa- I want you to know that last week yep. when you did the you did that intro, yeah. um, we all kind of – you silenced us. You silenced the entire feed. You silenced me. I choked up a bit. I was trying to hide it. I barely but, made it through, to be honest with you. It was, but anyway, I you know, I always – I loved him before he passed, and I'll always love him, and he, we've always got his music. Um, so yeah, to get yeah. off that trick, I, I got into – I went back to some Little Feet stuff. Oh, there we are. Time Loves a Hero, great little record, and this old Wilco record called A Ghost is Born. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I listened to both of those this week. Just sort of cleanse my palate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love it. What about uh, you, Jay? What have you been listening to? No, I can't. I gotta go last. Okay, I can go. Uh, <laughs> I'm still stuck. I'm still stuck on the uh, Nas record. I've said this the entire fourth season like since the beginning of the episode. year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Nas King's uh, Disease Three is in, has it's always in my in my in my rotation uh, at some point. Um, I, you know, I I I I've been listening to a lot of. Delta Blues. I had a really interesting conversation with with uh, Ben Harper the other day, talking about some old Delta Blues, and I was trying to just dive into some some different things. But then I refreshed Stevie and watched Rumble again, and mm-hmm. like Charlie Charlie Patton, man. Mm. I, like it. We'll get into that in a minute. But like like it, I look at him now and with this whole new perspective on how he wrote songs and why he wrote songs and the messages that he was singing about and talking about and, and performing uh, like it's a whole, a whole new thing, man. It was magical this week yeah. after refreshing my, you know, I had seen rumble. I watched it again. I kind of dove into it. Oddly enough, I was like, mom, before the show on Tuesday, you got to watch this. She watched every second of it. Yeah. And like, ah. I, watched it. I watched it again too. Yep. Yeah. It was pretty magical. Tim, what have you been listening to? Well, I, I'm kind of like Andy Lund. I kind of went down. I mean, I've always listened to Jeff Beck uh, religiously and huge fan and was fortunate to see him live with Stevie Ray Vaughan back. Uh, 1990? Uh, yeah, it was, I yeah, when they did that tour, they played Sports Arena in L.A. I was, at that sh- I was at that show, too. When it was magical, right? They, yeah. it, to see uh, the two of them play. And then I only... I didn't really meet him, but I years ago at a Nam show, I think I stood in line when I like in early eighties and he was signing autographs somewhere and had a joint in his hand and signed like a or looked like it looked like a joint. Smelled like a joint, but <laughs> and by God, I, it must have been a joint. So Could have it was been medicinal. Joint. It was medicinal. It was medicinal, yeah. Uh but anyway, I've been going down the uh the blow by blow, rough and ready. Uh, mm. Rough and rough situation. That 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 album is uh, a lo- that's one of my favorites, and mm-hmm. uh, that's just kind of listening and then plugging in my guitar and trying to capture one percent of what he could do. <laughs> right. The uh, thing is that. crazy too is that you he captures it every time live. Like you, any oh, video, I know. any yeah. video you pull up live is just like. What 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 just happened? How, what did what did what came out of that amplifier? Yeah, well, that's that, perfect. That's what's weird is whenever I've seen him a ton of times, and I'm always like, and some of my techs tech from like Jeff Tweedy, not Jeff Tweedy from Wilco, but Jeff Tweedy, the famous tech, and and he's like, I'm like, what is going on? There's something else going on back there with that Marshall because it sounds weird. Because no, nope, nothing else, and it's like I don't know what it is. It's what's coming out of that amp. You're always like scratching your head, like wait, that makes no sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's I know it's Jeff Beck's hands. Um, yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. Mr. Venezia, what has Roger been listening to? I mean, what have you been listening to? Well, Roger listens to everything I do. And we, it's a good thing because, you know, for both of us to be living here, my dog and I, we need to have very similar musical tastes. So it's the only way that this can work. He does add the squeaky toy aspect to it, which, you know, can grate on your nerves a little bit. But you know what? He's cute and he's a pug and I love him. But uh, what we've been listening to is, you know, we hit we hit the record stores like we do every weekend. And we went crate diving and dug through and grabbed a whole bunch of great things this past week. Yeah. Uh, namely, I wound up picking up a pretty decent copy uh, of, and an OG copy at that of Led Zeppelin 1, which mm. was great. Uh, also picked up Jay Gallagher's like an original frame. Like, like an original pressing? Not the turquoise logo that's worth oh, okay. like, you know, $5,000. But like at least, you know. Yeah, yeah, 68 yeah. 69 ish so wow. um so yeah but you know it's funny what you can get for a dollar sometimes um but yeah between leads up and one and i was never i know i'm going to get a lot of crap for this but i've never been a big fan of u2 um i never That's didn't fine. like u2 but i just wasn't a big fan of u2 i bought my first u2 album because i found a copy of the joshua tree on vinyl and i'm like mm-hmm. okay gotta grab that so i yeah. put that on and i'm like yeah i'm an idiot <laughs> for yeah. waiting, you know, sometimes 35 you, years to spin this record. You know? Sometimes it's a good you record. Gotta, 
Yeah, sometimes you got to find it, right? Yeah. I, it was the same thing for me. You know, I have these d- debates with people all the time. I was always more of a Beach Boys fan than a Beatles fan. And mainly it was because I had these two friends in middle school in, in Colorado, <clears throat> Tim, in Colorado, Littleton, Colorado. And I have this guy, these two twins. They were twin brothers. Oddly enough, they ripped on like Ibanez shredder guitars, but they were big Beatles fans. And they used to tell me I was stupid all the time because I didn't like the Beatles. But later on, I had to find it. So I get that, Mike. You don't always, you know what I mean? I mean, it's music. All right. Yeah, you know what? It comes and goes too. Sometimes that stuff you hate, you end up liking a lot. Years later, later. Your, brain, your brain changes, right? You know, again, not to put Kiss up there with, with uh, all these other bands, but when I was a kid, I mean, you know, sixth grade, uh, uh, I hated the acoustic intro to rock bottom. And I used to always take the needle and put it fast to the fast part. And so while I was working out the other day and I had this talk with Chad Smith from the Chili Peppers because he told me a story when he was in Detroit on on the Kiss Live tour and they opened up with rock bottom or something. Right? All of a sudden the rock bottom came on when I was working out the other day and I go, man, that is like intricate and beautiful. I hated it in sixth grade. And so now that I'm 100 years old, all of a sudden it really sounded good to me. So, yeah, sometimes it takes a bit of time. Yeah, for sure. Hey, we do also need to give a nod to David Crosby. We lost David Crosby this week. Yes. Um, that was, you know, it, it, it's really interesting because we just, it, it's like the tail end of Jeff Beck. So we're all trying to figure out losing this, this guitar hero of ours. And then we lose David Crosby uh, within, you know, days at the, you know, it was just, yes. So we agree with you. RIP Dave. Can, can we agree that that's the third? Yeah. Cause if they always come in threes, we had Jeff Beck, Lisa Marie Presley, yeah. David Crosby. Like that's it. Mm. Nobody else. No one else. Yeah. No one else can die the rest of this year. Stop, please. That's enough. Right. That's fair. Speaking of that, uh, we're going to just get right into this show. Um, it's Stevie again, we're so excited to have you on. Uh, and, and from time to time, we do some different segments going up front. But before, okay, so I'm going to walk through this 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 early thing. Before before we get started with the show, we have some really amazing shows coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, hopefully, we're going to get producer Gabe on the show, and we're going to talk about some more ES2 stuff. And he is nerdy about that, so we know all you ES2 lovers or haters out there should join the show, and we should talk about that. <clears throat> Last uh, we next week is a pre-recorded episode with Jason Scherner from Telefunken, um, but we discuss this really cool project he's working on. Twenty-five years ago, he recorded all uh, a bunch of live acoustic songs that the um, Blues Traveler did. So we're going to talk about that record. It's going to be great. We do have Sarah Nimitz and Linda Taylor joining the show at some point. So please join us every Tuesday. We appreciate you guys. Now let's get to know Stevie. Stevie. <laughs> All right. A guitarist, uh, music composer, TV and film producer, author, TV host, music director, uh, film producer, or excuse me, composer, songwriter, recording artist, and proud Apache. Oh, that, you know, that the guy in um, Slovenia, the promoter that promotes me out there, he put that in there. I thought that was corny, but I, they all like it in Europe, so that's very cool. But I am proud. But I never would usually have that on my. It's uh, it's it's actually it's actually written all over your website too. So I I bit some of this from your website and Wikipedia pages and stuff. All right, so let's go. Guitar player, writer, producer, composer. Okay, we love that. Stevie has recorded with over seventy different artists on uh, uh, recorded on over seventy different albums with many artists all over the world, having sold over two million solo albums around the world stevie has cited as one of the top 50 greatest guitarists of all time so that is one reason why we are excited but hold on hold on let me just tell it because it's a guitar show yeah okay it was the mid 90s (laughs) yeah i I had a i had an incredible publicist i was really popular around the world selling records and that's why i I made that poll where i was in the top i'm in the guitar player magazine book with like jimmy page and all these guys but I knew guys growing up in Oceanside and Carlsbad, California that never made it, that played in their, in their closet that could blow a lot of my friends away. So I don't really believe that I'm one of those things. But I was in the Guitar Player Magazine, 50 Greatest. I was. so, But, but I don't believe it. We true. believe it. So yes. let, us, let us believe. Yeah. 
We believe it, Stevie. Okay. <clears throat> so now that we know what in the heck you do, <clears throat> I want to play a little game with you called Yep Nope. Here's what how it works. You say yep if you've worked with this artist. You say nope if you haven't. It's a very easy game. All right. Okay. So let's do okay. this real quick. George Clinton. Yep. Justin Timberlake. Yep. Buddy Miles. Yep. T.I. Yep. Taylor Hawkins. Yep. Uh, Mick Jagger. Yep. Rod Stewart. Yep. Chris Allen. Yeah. Adam Lambert. Yep. Bootsy Collins. Yep. Mm. Ronnie Wood. <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, Bernard Fowler. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Steven Tyler. Yep. Uh, Billy Gibbons. Yep. Oh, interesting. Matt Sorum. Of course, yes. Uh, Quincy Jones. Kinda. Okay. Okay, we're there. Dolly Parton. I... No. Okay. Uh, Green Day. No. All right. See, look, guys. But but I tried to record a track with um with with, with you know Trace Monos or whatever you know his uh, whatever the drummer Trey Cool and um. I wanted to record the Bobby Freeman song "The Swim." We were at Donna Carey's party in L.A. and I and I still want to I still want to record it with him. Really? Yeah, yeah. See what I'm saying? So you will work with Billy Joe. Yeah, and I wouldn't mind working with Dolly Parton. You know, I used to hang out with Tammy Wynette. <laughs> okay, so we need Dolly and Tim. Can you help work some magic? We need Stevie and Dolly to meet. And- I think so. I think I, I, I see a good uh, collab happening. All oh, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I like what's going on here. All right. So that's a little fun game I wanted to play. We played that game with Paul Peshko. I don't know if you remember, Tim. Uh, and it was the same thing where it was like, yeah, he, it was like 40 different people. And it's like yeah. out of the 40, two of them he didn't work with. And and I believe the two he didn't work with were the ones that Mike was just randomly shouting out <laughs> like Slayer or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, OK, so Pesca, he's a cool guy, too. By the way. He's a very nice guy. He's always been a very nice person. Paul Pesco. Yeah, he's great. He was so fun on the show. In fact, yeah. Uh, the the interesting part about having him on the show is he had a guitar in his hand the whole time and he just noodled. Remember that, guys? He was just like he just did not stop playing. It was like showing the the love of how wildly into guitar he is. Okay. Um, you know, what, what, what it is with him too is I think his whole life when we were young, all of us we'd be in New York at the China Club or whatever. Now, I don't think he got the the respect that he as a great guitar player because he was like doing Madonna and stuff and not really getting a chance to rip. But he could actually rip. He just never had those kind of gigs, you know, where he got, like I was in Rod Stewart, so I got to play Jeff Peck's, Jeff Beck's guitar solo. So, you know, it looked like I knew how to play. But Paul, those of us who knew, knew that he really was a player. But a lot of the regular people just didn't know that he could really play. That's probably why he sits around and shows everybody how badass he is. <laughs> yeah, man, he's amazing. So we also do this other little segment called Useless Questions. That's what we call it. Um, hey, Mike, do you want to take Useless Questions tonight? I could totally take useless questions. However, I would love I need it my run of show use- up in front of me, so uh, which I do have. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we need a, we need I a do. producer around here, boys. We need a producer here. Let's go. We got one. This is our producer. It's our cheap, <laughs> low-budget show. Have you not seen my dog? My dog is a co-producer of this show. Um, That's awesome. I love so, that. So there's that. Um, I love it. Well, let's see. What do we got here? Alive or dead? Who is an artist that you'd love to collab with at some point or could have at some point if they were alive? Um, I know we named all the artists. There's none, no, no, there's none no, left. no, no, that's not true. When I, when I lived in San Diego, when I was a kid, I was driving past the sports arena with my sister and Rod Stewart was playing and, and we couldn't afford to go see the show. You know, it was like, okay. And I said to myself, one day I'm going to work with Rod Stewart, Mick Jagger and David Bowie. And I don't know why I said it, and I really believed it. And true shit. And my first gig was Rod Stewart. And then years later, I get a phone call. I'm doing Jagger. And I, then I start realizing I've met Bowie a few times, and I really wanted to work with him. But I, I just thought it would happen sooner or later. Uh, Reeves Cabrels was leaving. He said, you're getting the call. You're going to do it. And then I just didn't pursue it. And then he passed away. And, it, and it, I'm still kind of angry that even though I got to hang out and rap with him and talk to him, I did not record or tour with Bowie. And that would be who I, the mm-hmm. one I really missed. That's the one I really missed. I will say those 
two out of the three are probably two out of the three that none of us here have worked with. So you're still ahead. <laughs> yeah, you won. You, you're still you still well, won. It was um, Bowie. It was Bowie though. Was Bowie. Yeah. <laughs> um. So here's one that uh, we we love asking different guitar players because we all have this. What was the first song that you learned to play front to back, solo included, like every mm-hmm. every part of it? Oof, you know, it was probably, you know, Aerosmith's, uh, you know, Toys in the Attic or something like that. Because I I, um, I used to be at my parents' bedroom and I'd put on the record and try to learn. But I don't know if I really knew the solos. I was never really great at, at copying solos and playing them perfectly night after night. As a matter of fact, I'm still terrible at it. And um, so I can't say that I ever really got it all the way through, but... I would probably say something from, from you know, Aerosmith, uh, Toys in the Attic, Rocks, uh, and the, the, that ballpark. I mean, not too long ago, um, I was at, in Costa Rica on holiday, and Steven Tyler, Aerosmith was playing at the football stadium, so I popped over to see the show, and I'm backstage, and Steven Tyler's like, hey, why don't you get a play Last Child? And I'm like, I actually know that. I used to play it in my bedroom at my mom's house. And, <laughs> and Brad Whitford gave me a guitar, and I rocked out in front of 30,000 people and played Last Child. And it was like, thank God I could learn that in my mom's bedroom. Because that might have been one of the songs I learned, you know, all the way through. Hmm. All right. Not now, the last of, one. Oh, not many of us can say that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anybody on here can say that either. Uh, again, Steven, uh, Stevie wins this round. Uh, he has two rounds to none at the moment. Uh, we don't even need to check with the judges to see if that's, uh, you know, it's not even close. So Yeah, it's not even close. You're winning. You're winning this, this, this podcast, this primetime yeah. episode. All right, so there's one more of these useless questions, but it's actually useful. Um, now, we've already established you played with everybody except two people. And that was Dolly Parton and David Bowie. So since you played with everybody, what was the best piece of advice another musician gave to you? Oh, oh, that's an easy one. Um, okay, so my first band, I, I had a band in high school in San Diego called This Kids. And we were like really popular. We played all the college parties and stuff. And, and I finally, we toured around the Southwest playing universities. And I realized that if I was going to make it, I had to quit that band, even though we were great, and go to L.A., I went to LA, I starved, I slept on the, in a studio, uh, I slept in a closet for a while, and then I was homeless and slept at Baby O Studio on the couch where I met George Clinton. And, and then I instantly, like a year and a half later, I, I was playing guitar and Rod Stewart. So instantly I, had, I went from homeless and no money and San Diego kid to like loaded. And so right, when I, right before I made it, I saw Rod Stewart driving this Mercedes Benzdale Sunset Boulevard. And I'd never seen one like this before. And it was super customized, like AMG. I didn't know what AMG was in 1987. And um, I said to myself, oh my God, that's my dream car. So here I, you know, a year later or whatever, I'm in Rod's guitar player. So Rod, I hear him say, we're on the airplane. He says, I gotta sell that car. So I go, I gotta buy that car. And he says, okay, come over to my house tomorrow. You know, bring, bring 40 grand or whatever it was, I don't know. And so I came home, I got some cash. I went to his house and he said, I'm not selling you my guitar. This is the advice. It's a long winded to get to the story. He says, when I was a kid, I put my first record out and it, the single was Reason to Believe. And I got an advance and I went and bought a flat because I didn't know. He goes, I used to dig graves. And he goes, I didn't know if this thing was going to hit and I was going to have to go back to the digging graves. So I bought a house. And he goes, and luckily for me, Reason to Believe wasn't a hit, but somebody flipped it over and it was, it was, um, it was um, Maggie May, and that became a hit. Otherwise, I may have never made it. So he goes, take that money and go buy a house. So I went and bought a house in the cross that. There you go. That was the best advice he ever gave me. <laughs> That's a really good piece of it. That is a good story. Truth, yeah. There's so me. many. They, the, you always hear. You always hear that story of like people who get the advance and then they 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 blow it on cars or they blow it on something that's. It's silly. Uh, uh, interestingly, bands that I worked with, and we would all have it. It's the one guy in the band who pies the house, yeah. who is hey, well, still who is still um, successful. So. Not, not to not to be a jerk, but I'd already I already owned a Porsche. So <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's amazing. All right, all right, all right, all right. Such a jerk. I'm so sorry. So. <laughs> Hey, wait, wait, wait. I'm going to tell you one other thing you told me, though. And this, I tell this to kids all the time, because you know I've been a music director at American Idol, and I'm a music director Mick Jagger. But when I work with young kids, uh, Rod also, Rod was a good guy. People always think he's just like, you know, nuts and all this. Rod was amazing, because he was like an athlete, and he treated you like it was like a sports team. And he said to me, he goes, he told me, when my first album, Color Code, didn't do well in America, I was, I was pretty down. And he said to me, listen, he goes, your career's going to be full of mountains and valleys. 
He goes, when you're, when you're up, you can't stay up, but you keep going. But sooner or later, you've got to know you're going to go down and you're going to go down, but don't get depressed and don't stop. You've got to keep going, even when it's the bottom and you're the worst, because sooner or later, that road's going to go back up again and you're going to get back up. So never stop. And, you know, this is another amazing piece of advice he gave me because we all get our ass kicked, you know, every few years. And, and so, you know, Rob was really amazing for me. It was like a, like a big brother and then Jeff Gollum and Carmine Rojas and those guys. I mean, very helpful for that to be my first band. It was amazing for me as a young person. Man. Again, not a lot of us can say our first band was with Rod in Rod Stewart. <laughs> Stevie I, wins round Rod three. Stewart. Round yeah. three to Stevie as well. It, yeah. Sorry. Okay, I, this right, is a TKO into... at this point. It was a complete yeah. accident, by the way, guys. It was a total accident. Was but like... still, it's 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 amazing, and all these guitar nerds over here drooling just a little bit, like I am. It's, just, it's fantastic. It's super inspiring. If, if that this... was an accident, that's the happiest accident since Bob Ross. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. so great. All right, all right, all right. Before we get into Bill and Ted's, that's right. You heard what I said. Bill and Ted's excellent event here. I, I do have one real question. So thanks for that round of useless questions, everybody. That was fantastic. Uh, you're winning this entire game. It's actually a game. Yeah, there's, it's no longer a show. It's a game. All right. Okay. Um, no, but in all realness, when did you first get into playing guitar? And, and how did you get your start in the music industry? You know, I started, I started playing late. I, was, I, I had music around me my whole life. My stepfather was in a rock band. And he was really good and used to take me around and play at Palomar College and all these places in San Diego. And, and I was around rock. He's, you know, he was playing me, you're talking about Led Zeppelin One today earlier. And he was playing me Led Zeppelin One when it came out. And, you know, and I, you know, being a little kid, and I was living in Vista, California then. And so I was exposed to my, I just, you know, I love Sunshine of Your Love by Cream. I, so I had this music through osmosis in my system. My grandfather, a Native American guy who lived in Vista, uh, Cuckoo Maya, we call him Cuckoo, his name was Cruz, but he could, he, he, he could play like, you know, that, you know, little blues thing. And I thought it sounded so cool. He taught me how to play it. And, and, that, and I started noodling with that. And next thing I know, you know, I'm like 15 and, and I, I kind of get into it and I become obsessed with it. Um, and I, so I didn't start playing until I was 15. I was in a band mm -hmm. called This Kid's at 17. And, and it just kind of happened. It just kind of happened. You know, I, I, I told my dad, I promised him at 23, if I didn't make it, I was going to join the Coast Guard. So I had an out. And uh, I don't know, I just got lucky. I got so lucky. I mean, Bill and Ted wasn't even supposed to happen. None of this, this was, stuff was supposed to happen. So Perfect segue. Mike. Mike and I are both big Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure fans. I'm going to give this whole segment to Mike. Mike. I, right. I just want you to ask the Bill and Ted's questions, you know, because what do we do when we're not on the show? You and I watch Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, right? <laughs> That's all we do. There yeah. are 24 hours in the day. Eight are sleeping, eight are at work, eight are Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. So, <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. and there's, there's food in there sometime. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. See, you, you, it's still within you. So uh, as, as a person of a certain age and as a growing guitarist at that point, that movie for me was just like, <clears throat> Um, so for those of you that don't know and haven't seen it, this movie, uh, was part of a, the first of a trilogy turns out to be in the end, uh, it came out in 1989. It's about these two, let's just call them, uh, underachieving teens, uh, that basically are on the verge of getting flunked out of school and they're approached by essentially a time machine that helps them make the ultimate history presentation and they get through school. And then it turns out that 600 years later, their music changes the world. So, uh, which is very interesting. However, the guitar parts, those stellar guitar parts in the movie, which are mainly air guitar from the actors are actually played by one Stevie Salas. Yeah. And, you know, when we have to know, like, I have a few questions about this, but how did you get involved in this in the first place? Yeah. All right. So I was a staff producer in 1987 for a guy called David Kirschenbaum who was a legendary record producer and A&R guy. You know, he did, he produced all the, my favorite Joe Jackson albums, Look Sharp and I'm the Man and, you know, uh, Stepping Out and all that stuff. And he, he's super tramp. And I mean, he signed, he signed, uh, you know, Duran Duran, he did Duran Duran. He did like all kinds of huge stuff. And, um, and he, he, there was a guy in San Diego named Mark Levy 
who used to work with a really popular band called Tweed Sneakers and moved to LA and he was an agent. And when I moved to LA, he liked me because I was from San Diego and he remembered me from this kids. So he introduced me to David Kirschenbaum. And at the time I'd already played, was playing with George Clinton and Bootsy Collins and, and Thomas Dolby and P-Funk and that stuff. And, and so I understood funk music and, and rap was new, right? Rap was new music. Nobody really knew a lot about rap in LA unless you listen to KJLH and you know, and, and the, the LA Dream Team, which most people didn't know about, which was, uh, which was, what's his name? You know, um, The Chronic, it was his, his first group. Um, Dre. Blank and, Dre. Dre, it was Dre's first group. So um, David Kirschenbaum says to me, do you know anything about rap music? So that's what he used to call it, rap music. And I go, yeah, I know how to do rap music. And all I really knew is I, I, I was into Eddie Martinez and, and Run DMC. So he goes, okay, we have to do, we're doing, we're, I'm, I'm the music supervisor for a film called Action Jackson. And I need a rap song. I know there's a film called Big Shots. They're both Lorimar productions, whatever. And so I, 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 I met a guy called Gene Page, who was the orchestrator for Motown and did all the classic Motown stuff. And he liked me, thought I was a kid who was going somewhere. So he helped me and introduced me to these two 16, 17 year old uh, hip hop rapper guys called the uh, um, Pee, Wee, Pee Wee Jam and MC Jam. That was their names. And I took them into Power Tracks, which was David's studio. And I, and I made this kind of run DMC thing and I sampled my guitars and and um, everyone loved it. And it came out as a single on, on the Lorma, on, on Atlantic Records. So then everyone thought it was a genius, right? Like, oh, a genius. So it's like, okay. So David hires me as a producer and I do Action Jackson and I start working on. Tracy Chapman comes in to do her first album. Um, you know, it's like a really great environment. And then he says to me, he calls me in and he says, hey, listen, I'm, I'm doing a movie. Uh, and it's all about these two kids that are kind of like dummies and they don't, and they love rock and roll. And it's all about rock and roll and music. But we realized the film's finished, kind of, and there's no rock and roll in the film. Like, what? He goes, yeah, there's no guitar in the film. <laughs> so it was scored already by my buddy Amos Newman's brother, a cousin, I think. And I didn't know Amos at the time, but, you know, and so he goes, I need you to go play some guitar on it. So originally what I did was, the first thing I did was I needed to do the scenes when they were jumping around in the, in the garage, right? Okay. And I was kind of a serious... I thought it was a comedy, so I thought it was, I was kind of, I took it serious. And I didn't want to disrespect Bill and Ted, um, because every time I tried to play really bad, to me it sounded pompous and it sounded um, like I was like, <laughs> I'll just play shitty, you know what I mean? And, and I, I, thought, I, I felt embarrassed for myself, like I shouldn't be such an egomaniac that, you know, I felt like, oh, I'll just play shitty. It's like, that. how can I really play like I don't know how to play? So I turned my guitar uh, upside down. Uh oh. And I played left handed. <laughs> <laughs> Instant that's, how I, that's how I did both their parts. And so I had a, I had a, a Hamer guitar that Joel Danzig had sent me because I got a gig with Andy Taylor when he quit Duran Duran and then Andy fired me, but he let me keep the guitar. And then um, I, so I played that upside down for one sound. And then I had this Scotty Lentz guitar that I moved to. To, to LA with it, the San Diego builder named Scotty Lentz that knew me when I was a kid. And I played the other one upside down, so it sounded totally like two different, completely different sounds, you know? And one was Bill and one was Ted. And then later on, I, you know, hit a piano in the end scene and I had my drummer Winston A. Watson Jr., you know, playing drums like he didn't know how to play for that last scene when they were in the garage with the girls, you know? But, um, so I did that and then they, I brought up the whole score. And one of the first things I did was they said, uh, Stephen Herrick was the director. And I, he used to come to my house, so we'd sit on my floor at a futon, and my dad would be there when visiting. That's how easy going it was. Stephen Herrick wasn't huge yet. He hadn't done 101 Dalmatians yet, or Mr. Holland's Opus, or all that. He was pretty new. And so he says, listen, he goes, we really wanted you two in the scene of the, of the, when the you know, the Fee Waybill, and then we're in the future scene, you know, whatever that's called, the, the right. future, with, with Martha Davis, Fee Waybill, and, and Clarence Clements. And he goes, but we couldn't afford you too, so we used this song by a guy called Robbie Robb, who I didn't know, you know. So he goes, can you make it sound like you two? So I got out of delay, and I went, and I just started doing the edge kind of shit along Robbie's song, and I did it, and it became huge for Robbie. And there's no version of that. So people started stealing it off the soundtrack and, and trading it online. It's, they still do today. It's a song called In Time, and it's, you'll find it on YouTube. It says Robbie Robb's Stevie Solace version, right? It's just me trying to be the edge because we, we couldn't afford the YouTube. Speaking of YouTube, you guys couldn't afford the it. edge. Couldn't afford, couldn't afford the edge. <laughs> so I did that. And then I, then I started scoring over the whole score. So I added guitar 
throughout the whole film over the score that was there, which is really weird, it's unusual. So I scored over the score, guitar everywhere, you know, blah, 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 all, the, all the things. And, and, and that was that, everybody was happy. And then I went to record, and then I worked on the soundtrack and produced an unknown band then called Warrant for it. And, and that, that, which was weird, which was, you know, I didn't want to do it because I hated eighties metal, but, but you know, I had to do it as a producer. Then I fell in love with Warrant. They were the nicest guys and, I, and it ended up being something that I really loved. And Cherry because Pie. they were such good, they were good person. It was before Cherry Pie, but I did the, what became the first album. Yeah, I did that. And so long story short, I start getting busy doing something else. I produce Was Not Was. It goes number one. I get a phone call, Stephen Herrick. We're testing the movie. Oh, the movie's not going to come out, okay? It gets dropped. It's not coming out. So, so Bill and Ted guys, it, it, it's never going to see the light of day. It's over. Never going to come out. I go off. I do all this other stuff. I'm in England, blah, blah, blah. I come back. This is all before Rod Stewart, too. And uh, I get a call from Stephen Herrick. He goes, hey, we've got a new distributor. I think it was Della Retta's dropped us, and we're going to be on. I forget what it is. I, maybe it's the opposite. It was a long time ago, um, 1987, 88. So he goes, we tested the movie and everyone loves it because, but the ending's testing terrible. And I go, okay, what do you want to do? And he goes, we want to put a guitar scene in the end of the movie and we need you to do it. And I go, okay, I don't, whatever, I don't care. And so he goes, come to, tomorrow, you know, next week we're going to meet at this. So we went to the house in Brentwood. I think it was in Brentwood or California, you know, by the beach over in the west side. And they took some person's garage and they put the phone booth in it and all this stuff up. And they made us the Bill and Ted set inside the garage. And 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 they go, and I met Keanu for the first time and and and, uh, and um, Whoa. Alex, Alex, and the two girls and George Carlin. And they go, Stevie, you don't mind, you have to share a trailer with George Carlin. And I was like, ah! <laughs> so I sat in a trailer all night with George Carlin. He told me those amazing stories. And George and I both wore matching suits. So they shot me from, they're gonna shoot me from the neck down and George from the neck up. Cause it's supposed to be George playing that in solo, right? And um, hold on, I'm gonna pull something out for you guys too while I'm telling you this story, cause I have to have it. But um, so then, um, I stand on the soapbox, it's time to do this thing. And, um, and I'm not plugged into anything. And, and, and Keanu, I'm standing there and Keanu's standing here and, and the redheaded girl's here and the brunette girl's here and Alex is here and they're also looking up at me. And so I, and they stick a camera right there and I go, okay, so what do I do? And Stephen Hare goes, I don't know, just play anything. So I literally, thinking it was a comedy, I started with the eruption, and then I went off the diddle. And then what I did was I said, I'm going to move my fingers around as ridiculous as possible. So, because it's comedy. I don't want to be like a shredder guy. I'm just like, I'm going to ridiculous. Like, just try to be ridiculous. And because it, so it would look funny. Okay. And everyone loved it. Yay. Okay. End of the shot. Me and George Carlin are done. I get home. It's five in the morning. So I have to go back to the studio the next day and I have to score this thing. Okay, because it was, you know, I was playing air guitar, really. It was, I had a guitar on, but I was playing air guitar. So I put it up on the, on the monitor, and I'm like, oh, shit. So I, I just, I don't know, I, hit, I knew I hit the A chord. I hit the beginning of eruption. That's why, you know, the A chord. And then I just watched my hands. And I just followed my hands wherever they went. And then I said, okay, that's it. And I thought it was the stupidest thing I'd ever done. And it was funny, and I thought it was like ridiculous, and everyone's gonna get a good laugh, okay? Forget all about it. Go, boom, join Rod Stewart, blah, 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 world tour, I'm all over the place. And Bill and Ted's coming out, it's, now it's 1989, it's coming out. And I'm like, oh wow, it's coming out. And so I go to see it, and I'm super embarrassed, because I think I made an ass out of myself, right? I'm, I'm really embarrassed, because I played this guitar. <laughs> like, and I think everyone thought I was serious, and I was goofing around. Okay, comes out, sets the world on fire, becomes the biggest movie in the world, you know, billion dollars and blah, blah, blah. And, and I'm the guy who did Bill and Ted. And I used to get bitter kind of going, I'm gonna die and it's gonna say my headstone after all this cool stuff I've done with P-Funk, I'm the guy who did Bill and Ted. But now I love it so much because I, I was in a, a bar in London about five or six years ago, right before the pandemic. And I was hanging out in the afternoon with Jimmy Dunlap again, drinking margaritas. And, and these kids came up to me 
And they, we go to the university, blah, 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 you know, music, whatever it is. It's like their Berkeley of Music in London. And he goes, and our thesis this year is the, your solo and Bill and Ted. I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, tell me what it is. And they talked about how I went from, you know, a Mixolodeon to an Alabama and a Clouded 13.9. And, and I was just like, this is madness. I was trying to, I didn't, but I didn't want to tell the kids though, because I don't want to bum them out. Because they took time to really learn that, and study on how I came up with this whole score of genius. And there you go. There's your Bill and Ted. The cat's wow. out of the bag. Oh, but That's... then you know, every year, every year, like you know, Vi's my buddy, so Vi did the second Bill and Ted, and so like me and Vi, oh, we, we did Bill and Ted. And then recently, the three came out, and everyone's writing me like crazy. Are you going to do it? I'm like, no. It's like nobody called me for one thing, and I did. Uh, I did one, so I did the original, and and then uh, I started seeing these cool, cool posters of me and Vi and the guy, T Toby T Tassi, um, I don't know his name, but he's like some guy who plays a guitar with like twenty five strings on it. He's oh, Tosin really Abasi. Cool. Yeah, he's like really like like a super a forward guy, you know. And and I go, well, I just play the blues. I don't know, you know. So it was it was a cool poster, and I was I'm honored that I did it, and I'm in the poster with Vi and this guy. And and Co Tobin and and I'm who knows? Well, there you go. That's the real story. My oh, goodness, that's awesome. a good one. <laughs> that story was so good. Uh, it, it, it Tim, it reminds me of Ed Robertson telling the story of how he wrote the the theme song for the Big Bang Theory, where right. he he forgot that he had a meeting about pitching this or writing the theme song for big bang so he actually recorded it he actually came up with the melody and kind of hummed the lyric the, the words real quick and got out of the shower he was in the shower right before the meeting and then he recorded it to his phone and emailed it over to him and they loved it and that was it <laughs> to, oh there it is what what is that cv that's me and george carlin on the set the night i did the guitar solo look at our matching suits i love it i'm digging your hair your hairstyle it was 1987, man. Yeah. I, wanted to be, I wanted to be Steve Stevens. <laughs> That's right. <clears throat> yeah, there it is. The original shot from that night. Wow. Isn't that cool? That's very That cool. is amazing. All right, yeah. all right, all right. Well, thank you for that story. That was fantastic. Okay, let's dive into Rumble. I'm really excited to, to, to chat about this. So if you guys are familiar with the documentary Rumble, the Indians who rocked the world, um, it is a documentary um, uh, about the role Native Americans in popular music and history. So the the excuse me, the role Native Americans played in popular music in music history. So, uh, man, Stevie, what I mean, let me just dive into some interesting questioning that I've got here. But when you look at the landscape of rock music today. Do you still see Native American influences continuing to thrive? Well, it's it's probably more now, but, but what what it was what it was was um what it was was uh, influence is like it's more about all of us. Like I'm influenced by Jeff Beck, yeah, Jimmy Page, Pete Townsend, you know, um, Jimi Hendrix. Okay. Well, how I got it was through osmosis because they were influenced by Link Ray, right? Jeff Beck actually told me right to my face. He goes, you know, he goes, me and Jimmy Page used to jump around on my bed at my mom's house playing air guitar to Link Ray. And the visual, the visual of Jimmy Page and Jeff Beck jumping around like playing air guitar was so fascinating to me. So I think that the Native influence is something, for Rumble, it was more about, not about Native American musicians today and all the great musicians that there are out there. It was more about, um, it's more about the, us, the identity of rock and roll at the yeah. earliest level, having this cornerstone of influence there. You know, I, the weirdest thing about my career was, or it is still maybe, is that I could go out and play with the MC5 and I could play with Parliament Funkadelic. You know, somehow I can dance down the middle of the of the white world and the black world and fit in my own weird thing. And I really think that's the same thing with a lot of those guys like Jesse Ed Davis and uh, Link Ray. And well, Link was more, you know, Link was doing something. I, I don't know what made him 
decide to like rock like that and hit those distortion chords and and do that you know the madness that was inside of him but you know would would we know you know pete townsend tells me at first he was like oh you know i was very uncomfortable when i first heard link ray i remember yeah. thinking, well, and then later on you know he was like oh no no i mean i was on to all kinds of other stuff so you know all these guys had these things there but uh it all really what made him do that i have no idea you know you, charlie Patton. you know you understand he was maybe he was kind of like Jimi hendrix in a way from what i people would say i would rock out and guitar and do all he was a real showman right the sh real yeah. true showman and so jimmy jimmy hendrix probably learned all that stuff doing the chitlin circuit and all those african-american and native native blended uh, native blend uh, you know people that came up charlie Patton dude and Hall of, helen wolf was you know learning from charlie Patton and and all this stuff you know you have to figure that uh, all that osmosis is where what rumble was about it wasn't about I taught this guy how to do a, you know, an, an A chord. It was more like this. There was a something about that lifestyle and about that yeah. way they did it is that in, in, in bledded in all of us. And whether we didn't know or not, we got a lot from them by accident through somebody else that we listened to that listened to them. Right? What I what I really appreciate about Rumble is not only the story. Like I didn't really even know who Charlie Patton was until right. I saw that, but but I knew the people after him. I knew Holland Wolf, you know, I knew how it related to the Stones and all that, right? But what I really like about Rumble is that it's like it's like the the history lesson, the dark, ugly history lesson, yeah, of American history that you won't you will not get in school, right? You didn't have you, well, you yeah, yeah, some places you get it, but not everywhere. And and there's it's not only about music, it's about it's about it's about people that are enslaved and oppressed and how that you know and how their life was and to me that that was just as heavy as the music when i watched that movie so let me back up wait, wait, wait let me let me comment about that because really what rumble was really about was rumble yeah. we used to we used the music to show you really that how north america was developed and you you got it yeah. if all of you have been to england right and no disrespect i loved when i lived in london but there's no way they did not invent gumbo and they did not invent these incredible dishes right this was all done by the poorest most downtrodden people and the scottish people hanging out with the with the french and hanging out with the blacks and hanging out with the natives and and that's those were the flavors that became just somebody else took credit for it you know we we all and i was brought up to believe that the delta blues was an african art form i was just brought up to believe that until one day billy gibbons pulled up a picture of charlie Patton. he says to me look at the Look at this, Stevie. It looked to me like he got wavy, curly, blonde hair. And I'm like, what? Because there's red hair, right? But yeah, I mean, he's the first one that made me look at that. And then, you know, my neighbor here in Austin is, is a guy called Charlie Sexton. And Charlie, um, Charlie's a great guitarist and, you know, historian. And one day I was jogging in the neighborhood and I run past Charlie's house and he's mowing the lawn, right? And he says, starts talking about Charlie Patton. And he says, you know, everybody thinks that, that, um, they think that, um, you know um oh what's his name you know the crossroads um, robert johnson robert johnson. everyone talks about robert johnson because he had the sexy story he goes but anybody who knows really knows it was charlie Patton. and i mm. thought wow and this is all while i was still working on rumble and i was doing an exhibit at the smithsonian about it and so yeah you know you, once you started to look all the information was there i just yeah. never never none of us ever saw it you know so what was um, what how did rumble come to be was it an idea that y you and some other people had or did ha i mean where did it come from was it you know a, a, a I, thought I know, eating I, dinner I one night no 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 what happened was um i was telling myself after 13 solid years of touring the world and making albums and touring the world and, and being sick of the music business and just you know i was getting old and i was tired and I um, wanted to retire in, 19, in 2000 after uh, after I headlined one of the headliners at the Fuji Rock Fest, and I said, "That's it. This is my last gig. I'm done. I hate rock and roll. I hate music. I hate the business. I'm, I want to go surf around the world or something." And um, I um, I lost a million dollars in the stock market, and 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 I had to go back to work. I just got crushed. And um, luckily for me, I got a phone call um, to go open for the Rolling Stones in Canada. 
And I flew up to Canada, and while I was there, a Native American guy named Brian Wright McLeod called me and said, hey, I want to interview you for a book I'm doing about every Native American recorded project going back to 1908 and wax cylinders. And, and I go, okay. So I sat with him, and after I, he interviewed me in Toronto, I, he started telling me about Jesse Davis, who I had no idea was a Native American. I used to, you know, when I was in sixth grade, I had the album Atlantic Crossing. And I remember, oh, Jesse Ed Davis, what a cool name, you know. I used to see his name on John Lennon records and all these records. I never knew he was a Native American, right? I had no idea. And so I, um, he told me about Link Ray. I go, I know that. I know that song. I didn't, he's a Native American. I was just like blown away. And so I said to myself, I go, I need to do something in the position I'm in as a Native American person um, to give back to Native American people and leave something other than an image of me being a monkey jumping around on the stage with a guitar. You know, I, I needed to do something more important. I wanted to do something more important. And, and so I thought, okay, maybe I could get a coffee table book made with like, you know, all these guys in it. So Native American people would see like they have role models that aren't from just 125, 150 years ago. You know, they had modern role models that did incredible things that had to keep it secret that they were Native and to get through and that, that somehow they did and it can be done. And then that didn't really work. And so then what happened was um, I gave a speech at, the, at an opening of a recording studio that I, that I helped a really great dear friend of mine who's no longer on the planet, Kenny Hill, make in Six Nations. And, he, uh, and, I, and I talked about being around the world and Native American people, because Native American people really th think a lot of people hate them. You know, they think they're, especially on the reservations, they think like white people hate them. And it's not true. I go, people around the world love us and they want to know more about us. And I go, so my thoughts were, I am going to, instead of bringing one native guy into the mainstream, I want to bring the na mainstream to Native America. And the guy was there, was a Mohawk guy named Tim Johnson, who was, a, who was the, the co-director at the Smithsonian National Museum of American Indian in Washington, D.C. And he says, will you come down to Washington, D.C. and I want to show you the museum. So I flew to Washington, D.C., Show me the museum, and I told him the story of Rumble, my idea about these musicians. And he looked at me, and we're on a train to New York City from Washington, D.C., and he says, let's make an exhibit. And I'm like, okay. And so he, they hired me, and I came in, and they put a team around me, and we made this exhibit about the subject of Rumble, which was called uh, Upper We Belong Natives in Popular Culture. I wanted to call it Rumble, but it was too wild for the Smithsonian people, right? And, and, it, and, and it was only supposed to run for three months, and it ended up running for six months and became the most important exhibit, biggest exhibit they'd ever had. And then we moved it to New York, made it four times bigger, it ran for a year, and it was the biggest exhibit they ever had, most popular, brought in a real diverse crowd of people. You know, they didn't want Randy Castillo in the, in the exhibit because they thought Ozzy Osbourne was too lowbrow. And I was like, you don't get it. I go, there's going to be kids that come in here just to see Randy Castillo. And sure shit, and that's what happened. And so then when I finished the, the New York run, I said, I got to make a movie out of this because I was already producing television at that point. And um, I went and pitched it, and everyone said yes. And next thing I know, oh, wow. I, I spent five years, you know, making Rumble, and it came out in one Sundance, and then the whole world changed. You know, it was crazy. Wow, mm -hmm. that that's incredible. So, in today's world, um, who is today's Randy Castillo? Who is today's Redbone, Charlie Patton, Link Ray? Is there anybody today? We, you know, that they can be of any color. You know, right. to me, it's not important now that they're, they're somebody that's that person that's that color. It, it has to be Native. I think that what they did, Rumble is about people that changed the world. You know, Steven Tyler would say to me, like, man, when me and Joe Perry were sitting around the house and trying to figure out what we wanted Aerosmith to sound like, we'd listen to Taj Mahal and Jesse, Jesse he called him Jesse, Jesse, Ed, Jesse Edwin Davis. And, and I go, that's how you guys, he goes, yeah, we wanted to sound like the, the Taj record with Jesse Ed Davis, you know, and then uh, Dwayne Allman was learning how to play slide with Jesse Ed Davis. You know, so what it was really about was that the people that taught all of us about rock and roll learned from these guys. And I thought that is a big story. That's a big story. Mm -hmm. yeah, now, let, me, let me tell you, though, um, I, I had to really walk a tightrope because I didn't want to make a race film. You know, I had seen films where, like, somebody sure. would say, like, you know, Elvis Presley was a racist, you know, Little Richard invented rock. And I, I thought that was negative and I hated that because I like Elvis. I love Elvis Presley and I love Little Richard. So I go, I, I had to really fight with my director about not turning it into a race film about racism and Ku Klux Klan. And I wanted to make it a film about heroes. And and that was the that was the trick. So in order to do that, I couldn't say that, uh, you know, 
Tim Godwin learned how to play guitar from listening to this person without Tim Godwin saying it. Right. So I had yeah. to get Eric Clapton to talk and I had to get Jeff Beck to talk and I had to get I had to get the real guys. Because if if I told you Jesse Ed Davis was one of the greatest guitar players in the 70s, you might say, eh, he was all right. But if Eric Clapton says it, you're mm-hmm. gonna go, hmm, maybe I better think about this at least. Right. So that was the hard part. And luckily, I had a phone book with a lot of great names in it that I called on and it worked out. Man, uh, you know, I, thank you. First off, thank you. Thank you for for. I, I, I truly believe that you delivered on on what you were trying to do. I think that it's it's heavy. There are parts of it that is it's, it's historically heavy. I think that it's but I think that it's something that you 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 need to watch. I mean, my mother and I had a nice little chat about it. Like she, these are things that she didn't know. She just turned 83 a couple of years ago or a couple of weeks ago. Excuse me, a couple of years ago. <laughs> she just yeah, yeah. turned 83 a couple of weeks ago. But and she's lived such this, you know, this long, you know, cultured life. And there were things in there that were 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 impactful for her. So thank you for delivering on that. Um, you know, I have more questions. What drew you to working with Bernard Fowler and, you know, Koshi mm. and Abba? And I, mm. I mean, mm. well, Fowler, Fowler was already kind of a legend when I was coming up in the late 80s in L.A., um, because he was in Tackhead and he was doing, uh, yeah. you know, Her- Herbie Hancock. And, and we all knew who he was because, you know, there's like a crowd, you know, that you you try to roll with. And, you know, it was, I was a kid, you know, and it was, he's got, they were all older than me, but it was Fowler and Steve Jordan and, and Ivan Neville and me. Ivan Neville was one of my first friends I made in L.A. kind of, and Ivan and, and then, you know, their association with the Stones and then and Bill Laswell, who was producing my early records, was, was producing, was working with Bernard Fowler way before anybody. And so what happened was um, I changed record labels after a, a couple of color code albums and I was kind of in a, a lost soul. I didn't know what I wanted to do. It was like 1992 and I, I didn't want to go back to, somehow I became known as a guitar shredder because I opened up the Joe Satriani tour in 1990 and, and I love <laughs> Joe, but then I wasn't trying to be a guitar. I was trying to do James Brown, you know, hard rock James Brown songs. And, and somehow I became like, you know, I'm grateful that I was a popular guitar player and they liked me as a guitar. I love that. But that was not my goal. And so, but then after being out with Joe Satriani for six months, I was that guy. I was sudden, right? It was weird. And so Bill Laswell calls me one day and I'm, I'm in Canada writing songs and we're recording with, this, with the, the great Jeff Healy, who's no longer with us. And Laswell calls me and he says, hey, uh, two things. He goes, you're going to get a call from uh, Miles Davis's drummer, um, Tony, Tony, uh, I'm, blank, I'm blanking right now. He's a famous guy. And he goes, you got to do that gig. And I go, okay, who is he? I don't, I don't even know. Because I met Miles Davis when I was making my first color code album. He came and hung out because of Laswell, <laughs> right? And it was weird, right? Joey Ramone, too. I first time I went to CBGB's. Joey Ramone took me, um, and I'd never been, because he came to the studio to see Laswell, you know? So Bill Laswell says, you got to work with this uh, t- Tony, uh, Tony Williams. And he goes, also, I, I think we should do a record with Buddy Miles. And I'm like, What? I go, is he alive? I didn't know. He goes, yeah. And he goes, yeah, because because me and Bootsy were going to do, we, I'd already done What's Bootsy Doing, Bootsy's solo album. And then Bootsy wanted to do a rock record with me, a rock funk kind of a record. And he goes, let's get it, let's do it with Buddy Miles. And I'm like, can he still play? And Buddy goes, and Bill Laswell goes on, his, and I quote, who cares? It'll be comedy. That's what he said. And I'm like, shit. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm scared. I don't want to do it. And, and, and Laswell, and then Bootsy Collins calls me and goes, listen, man, you're stu- you're, don't be stupid. You're a little kid. And the people are going to go, who's this little kid playing with Buddy Miles and Bootsy Collins? Is a rhythm so you've got to do this. But I was really scared. I was like, what the hell? I'm terrified, actually. So I go to New York. I do the record. And I ask, I want to meet Bernard Fowler. Could he come and help us sing, help me sing on the record and help? And, and last we'll call him. He was in Ireland producing Ronnie Wood. And he goes, I'll fly home this week. And he, he flew home and he came in the studio. We met. We worked on this album called Hardware. Me, Buddy Miles, and Bootsy Collins were the, it was a trio with Bill, you know, George Clinton and Bernie Worrell and, and Fowler and Mudbone Cooper. And and um, and me and Fowler just became best friends. Like we were just like brothers. And he was already in the stones. And um, and that's what happened. We've been like brothers ever since. Me and him are super tight. <laughs> so these are the stories we're all looking for. This is the Guitar Nerd Podcast. Uh <laughs> 
Yeah. 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 It's all true. Like, so this is round exactly five. Round, round five. five you're winning now round won. five. Right. <laughs> I got. I got one more question in, in in round five. We're about to go to round six. Uh, <clears throat> and then I think we're gonna play one more game. I have an idea to play a game at the end here. Okay. So, does your heritage play a role in the music you make? Or the yeah. way you play guitar, and if so, how how does it? Well, I didn't understand. Well, uh, first of all, I always I was never the guy that like put on buckskins and made my heritage a part of my how I sold myself. And right. a lot of guys do that, and that's fine. I don't. I have nothing against that. I just didn't want to be that guy. I wanted to be known as one of the greatest and work with the greatest, purely from my you know from what I was doing musically and how I was writing songs and thinking. And, and the Indian thing, the native thing was who I was as a human being in the background, you know, it was what I did to find my balance really. But when I started to work on rumble, I started to realize when I was talking to Buffy St. Marie and I was talking to Robbie Robertson and these people that all of us were sort of like misfits, like the home for misfit toys, right? Like, you know, we didn't fit in here and, and I wasn't, I wasn't mainstream and I couldn't, I couldn't be in Bon Jovi and I, I couldn't, I, I, I wasn't, you know, it's like we were this weird middle ground, but we fit, you know, Jesse Ed was playing with John Lennon and he, was, he played with all four Beatles and he was playing with Clapton and Rod Stewart, you know, and I kind of was, I was playing with the most famous people in the planet and nobody knew who I was though either like those guys, I could walk down the street and nobody knew who the hell is that guy. And, and, and I'm not, so I was like the most, these guys and myself sometimes were like, it's a joke. We're like the most famous guys. You don't know who they are and never heard of them. You know, <laughs> but like Steven Tyler calls, Hey man, why don't you come down bro, you play walking the dog or whatever, you know? And I was able to f navigate. And I think Robbie kid, Robbie's a perfect example. Robbie can do this thing. That's new agey and bluesy and can play with Clapton, but he can also, you know, it's like, so I think my native American sense of rhythm, and Robbie's sense of rhythm and Buffy's sense of, sense of rhythm, Randy Castillo's sense of rhythm, you know, all the metal guys said he didn't play drums like a metal drummer. He had a different kind of a flow, you know, mm -hmm. and I think it's, I think it's in our DNA is, is a sense of how we hear, how we hear the downbeat, you know? So I don't know. I, I think that, you know, before we get, move on to round six here, which is Japan, round uh -huh. six is Japan. And so we'll get there in a second, but I, I think that, that was such a impressive moment and a very inspiring moment in rumble is mildred bailey the whole segment on mildred bailey when you hear mm -hmm. when you hear frank sinatra or you hear you know the greats talking about how she was you know th their inspiration to sing i mean sinatra right yeah, yeah. And, sinatra and, and it's okay. mildred bailey so if you don't listen to mildred bailey or if you haven't listened to her entire catalog is on spotify if, if that's where you listen it's probably on youtube as well or apple music or dig through the records and find it but you i think you did just to wrap a bow up on this rumble section here is you did man you did such an incredible job telling these this telling these stories and this history lesson that we needed to hear and so i i would I applaud Thank you for you. that. And everybody who worked on the yeah. film, it was so spectacular. Guys, go see Rumble. This is absolutely it, it is. Yeah. It is a real thing. And Tim brought it to me. Right. Tim's like, have you seen Rumble? And yeah. with, we you, he introduced us to to you, a small group of us. And it was just it's it is outstanding. Go go check it out. Um, so Wait, round I, six. I, let me tell you real quick about Mildred Bailey, though. OK. All uh, right. I'll take so, any sort of Mildred Bailey okay. story. There's two things about her that's, that's uh, unique to a lot of these people. One was the fact that she was just incredible at her, her gift um, as, a, as a singer, right? Um, but then there's this thing about when I talk about the movie is about the, the Indians that rocked the world and how the movie is about the Native Americans that influenced everything they know in pop music in, in one way or the other, right? Mildred yeah. Bailey, who was Mildred Bailey's first person she hired to be a singer First of all, she's the first woman, let alone they all thought she was a black woman. But she was the first woman to get a radio, her own radio show. OK, that's super like a pioneering. Then who's the first singer she discovers and makes puts on her show and makes him her her local singer till he makes it big. Bing Crosby, who went on to become the biggest selling singer in the history of America until Elvis, I think, or Frank might have been bigger than Frank. I have to go back and look. 
So she discovers Bing Crosby, right? So we were, we were shooting Tony Bennett, you know, and I'm at, up at his house, right? And he just starts singing. Oh, I love Mildred. He goes, oh, I love Mildred Bailey. Oh, the rocking chair, little chamber. And I'm just standing there going, like, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. It's like, I'm trying to be cool. You got serenaded by it. You just Tony singing. Bennett. Okay, and then, but here's another pop culture bit. When I was a little kid, I used to watch Bugs Bunny. Okay, Mildred Bailey's big song was Melancholy Baby. I never understood why there's a scene in Bugs Bunny where this Indian guy comes out, you know, with the full, like, wood, looks like a wooden Indian. He goes, pardon me, you know Melancholy Baby? And, 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 and then he walks off. And I always laugh, but I had no idea what it meant. It's because hmm. Mildred, because the insiders knew she was a Native American. So there's an, uh, they, had, they had an Indian guy come up and ask Bugs Bunny if he knew how to play Melancholy Baby. And, it's, and, and I never understood what the hell wow. was going on. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> That's so great. Oh, man. All right, round six. Rumble is done. You won, wow. you won round five. So uh, <laughs> you were five, you were five and oh on this game show we call Primetime this week um but but japan yeah. japan is it's it's uh, asia is a very important market for us as far as taylor's guitars is concerned andy lund over here in the corner next to you is uh he manages sales and artist relations and does a lot of marketing stuff for us over in the asian market so andy i'm going to give this whole section to you oh, my friend okay. we could do a whole show on rumble you know sometime I, we could do a whole show on mm -hmm. rumble. just you know the song though? Well, the Link Ray song. Let's bring in like Wayne Kramer and a bunch of the guys from the film when they do it. It'll be great. Yeah. Okay. You heard it here. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We can do that. Okay, Episode do 83. That. So the first time that I met Stevie was in July of 2020. And uh, Tim Godwin had just made a really cool guitar for him. It's a, it's a builder's edition. It's, it's like a custom mm -hmm. builder's edition, right? It's a B, BE717, right? I think. Yep. Yep. A red guitar, kind of a really cool, as I remember. And Badass. yeah, and you were getting ready um, to go over to Japan to tour a record that I think came out in 2020, mm -hmm. right? With uh, Kochi and Ibasan from the, the, a band called The Bees. The Bees is a uh, one of the best selling Japanese rock pop bands ever of all time, and somehow. So here's another here we go on another uh, another <laughs> round somehow Stevie knows Inabathon as well and has made two, is two records is that right with you've made with Inaba? well I played on all his most almost all of his solo albums too and then he played on some of my solo albums in the 90s um so we go way back me and him and talk Matsumoto where you know we, all right yeah yeah Bees is basically a duo uh a songwriting yeah. duo and then yeah. they have other people that play with them but yeah, but they're the biggest selling act in the history of Japan. I believe they've, you know, over 100 million records. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're also Taylor players, too. But how did you get how did you get hooked up with those guys? And um, well, how did you meet them? Well, first of all, uh, Tak was a huge fan of mine in my early Color Code records. So I was in Japan and they wanted to meet me and they weren't famous yet. And they would come over and hang out with me. And, and then they came to L.A. once and I had a house in the Hollywood Hills near the Baked Potato. And they wanted to go to the baked potatoes. So we went down there. And it's a story. Koshi hates this story. Because Koshi wasn't a drinker. But me and Taki used to be able to drink a lot. And we were down there at the baked potato. And this was like early 90s. And I lived in this house on the hill. And Richie Cotton was my neighbor. And Luke Luther's house was around the corner. And, you know, in this cool neighborhood we were all living. Grew up, you know, hanging out in L.A. during the wild years. And um, we're at the baked potato. And, and Koshi Inaba passes out from drinking too many drinks. And so me and my, me and Tuck got to take a moment. I carried Koshi on my shoulder up the hill to my house and put him on the couch while me and Tuck kept drinking, partying, you know. And so we, you know, Koshi and Koshi was shy and he was quiet. And I was hanging out with Tuck all the time. He picked me up in his Ferraris and all this stuff. And uh, then one day I got a call from Koshi and he was doing a solo album and he asked me, and he loved my song Start Again for my Back from the Living album. And he asked me if I would maybe help him and play on it. And I couldn't, I was on a big tour and I just couldn't do it. I just, I wanted to. So then his next album came and he asked me to play guitar on it. So I, I did guitar on the whole album. And then, then we started hanging out more. And I'd come to Japan all the time and play Fujiwaka, do the sets. And, and they'd all come hang out with me. We were just friends, you know. All the people in Rumble, they're just, fr we're friends, you know, we're colleagues and buddies. And so we'd hang out. And so no big deal. I did a few of his albums and he played harmonica on some of my albums and sang and talk with Jam and 
all my friends would play. And, you know, and every album that he was on would go gold, right? Because he's like so famous. And so one day around 2016, I was somewhere and, I, and the phone rings and it's him and he's kind of down. He's like, hey, I, I'm really depressed. I'm kind of burned out. I haven't been able to write a song. Um, you think you'd want to come to Tokyo and maybe try to write a song with me? I'm like, yeah. So, you know, it's you Naba. So the next thing you know, I'm in first class. I'm on the way to Japan. I'm getting picked up in a limo. And I got, you know, the whole thing, man. It's like rock star shit. And uh, I go down <laughs> and, he, and, and, and he's got his own studio with a giant SSL in it. And he, but he's the most humble guy. And I just said, I got these ideas. I go, let's, let's write some songs for fun. And I go, I don't want it to sound like a Stevie Solis album with Koshi singing. And I don't want it to sound like a Koshi solo album with me playing. I go, we're going to do three things. We're going to listen to late 80s. When I, when I was a kid before Rod Stewart, I used to go to London a lot and play guitar. And everything in 87 and 88, back when I was producing Was Not West, had synth bass with slapping real bass on it. Like, you know, Duran Duran and uh -oh. all that stuff, right? So I said that I said... We're going to have that on every song. And then I go, but we're going to have some punk rock. And, it, and I go, the guitars have to sound like we recorded them on The Clash in 1984. And he goes, okay, let's do it. So we just start writing these songs. And then he goes, let's do it again. So I came back again. I came back four times that year. And on the fourth time, his manager says, these songs are amazing. You know, we're going to put the record out. What are you doing in January? And it was like November. I'm like, wow, what do you mean? And that's why I wasn't at Rumble one Sundance. I wasn't there because I went to Japan and tour with Koshi. Because I didn't think we were going to get in Sundance, let alone win Sundance, right? So he booked this huge tour and it sold out in like three minutes. And so he goes, put any band together. Who do we want? So I got, I got, uh, you know, it's rock star stuff. So I had big budget. I, I got uh, Matt Sherrod, who was with Beck and Crowded House to play drums. I got uh, Stuart Zender from Jamiroquai to come out and play bass, brought him over from London. And, you know, and I had Amp Fiddler from Parliament Funkadelic, you know, and, and who played with Seal and Jamiroquai coming on since. And, we put this band together and it, it was just super fun. And the album went out, went number two right away, like real number two, like on the on the real chart, not like number two on like, you know, some weird chart. Pop chart, massive sales, went gold immediately. And we go, wow, this is kind of kind of something cool. And then we came back and played a, a giant football stadium festival. And and then um So that was the Chubby Groove. The Chubby Groove, That's right. a Chubby That's Groove record. Yeah. And so then we came back before the pandemic, we made another album called Maximum Huevo. <laughs> so we have these stupid maximum wave, right? Maximum wave, and we we put out a we put the record out was putting the record out and put the tour on sale. And this time, instead of doing like you know three nights at six thousand seaters, we were doing three nights in a row at twenty five thousand seaters. And it was oh we sold goodness. eighty we sold eighty five thousand tickets in like four minutes. And this was crazy. Now, now it was crazy. And all of a sudden, as an old man. I'm going to take my son who's never really seen me play. And he's coming to Japan, man. He's going to see dad on stage at, you know, Castle Hall, you know? And it's just like, it's like, for me, it was a dream come true to have my son be able to see this part of me that he didn't know at all. Right. You know? And, uh, and then the pandemic hit and we had to send all the money back. So. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Is that going to happen? If you were, are you still working on it? What? I talked to him. I talked to him last week, and he's doing a solo thing right now. And then the bees are doing a thirty-five year anniversary tour, and we're hoping. I'm hoping, and not just for the money. I mean, I just love. You know, I, I want one last chance to be on that giant stage, and and you know, there's something that's exhilarating about, you know, blowing up gigantic arenas. I mean, I live for that. I live for those giant shows, and I and I love them. And um, I hope I get to do it one more time, you know, before I'm too old to, to rock, you know what I mean? Yeah. Jay, Jay and Mike, I don't know if you, if you knew this, but we did a promo back back in when I said in July of 2020 where we we had – Stevie was kind enough to re record one of his songs, Indian Chief, which I believe is about your father, if I remember yeah. the conversation. Yeah. And he did, a, he did an acoustic version of it with that guitar that Tim hooked him up with. And then we had Japanese people, his fans from Japan, play along. And they had a videotape themselves playing along with him. And yeah. then we, we picked the top five videos, which were all over the place. I mean, some of them were super cool musically. Some of them were like wacky, like interpretive dance shit and stuff. Yeah, right? that's right. I that one. The little yeah. guy, right? So yeah. it, it, was kind of the, it was kind of the primetime version of in Japan. It was, it was called Home Edition. And Maski co-hosted it, or he hosted it for us. And um, But that was a really fun little promo. And then... CV got to watch the final five, the best five, and he picked the winner, and that guy got a free guitar. And that was, yeah. a, that, was that was a really fun show. I had a good time on that one. That's good fun. That was good fun. 
So yeah. besides rocking giant stadiums, um, what are your three favorite things to do in Japan? I, I love eating in Japan. The food is always like amazing. I love the, the, the fact that the people there don't judge each other. Like mm. you can dress up. If I wanted to show up to work and wear a tutu with a Bozo the Clown wig on, People wouldn't walk in and go, what the hell are you doing? They're just like, oh, hi, Stevie, how are you? Like, nothing's going on. It's like they don't judge at all. It's, it's like really cool. That, you know, I, when I was young, I don't know if it's like this still, but it used to be I could walk down your Yogi Park in the nine, early 90s, and I, you could try an experiment. You could take your wallet full of cash and just drop it on the ground and start walking, and someone would pick it up and run after you to give it back. Yeah. And and, and yeah. It, 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 it's unbelievable. You know, people just don't know being – there's so many amazing places in the world that people have no idea how, what, what life is really like. And in America, sorry to say that they've not traveled a lot. Everyone's been told we're the best, number one, we're all this stuff. But there's so much, there's so much, there's so many amazing things going on around the world that, yeah. that most people have no idea about. And the, the, the kindness of people and the common sense of people. And the fact that those places love art and artists. They don't care if you're, they like you maybe because you're the most popular, but they really love the art and they stick with you. You know, yeah. like when I used, to, I used to get a record, I'd wait for the new Cars album to come out without even hearing a song, just buy it anyways, because right? I was a fan. And they still have a lot of that in Europe and in Japan and those places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely agree with you on that one. What do you notice about Japanese musicians? I don't, I don't mean to. What do you, well, what do you like? You've, well, you've, you've got a lot well, of. I'll I'll tell you that when I was young, they used to be like, it was a big joke. Okay. I'd be playing a concert and it'd be five Stevie solaces there. They'd have my haircut. They'd have my same outfit on it. And we don't, my roadies would all, it was like, it was no mercy. It was brutal. And you know, there was a Rod Stewart there and there's a, there's a Tina Turner and, and now they've developed their own sound and their own style and they no longer worship us just because we're Americans or the British. Like they used to, it used to be, you know, you could do anything if you're British and you're still a God there. No, nah, man. They're like, oh, who's that? Oh, yeah, he sold 20,000 records, but, but the guy I like just sold 2 million. You know what I mean? It's like they, they have their own sound, their own style, their own um, everything, you know, and so it's changed a lot. Yeah. Round six. Yeah. Ding. Round six. All right. Round seven is a game. Right, we're we're going to play a little game with Stevie. But before we get started, this game is called Famous Steve's. Yeah. Um, the way the game works is we're going to roll through our phone contacts and we're going to tell each other the most famous Steves that we have in our phone. Okay. And, but I heard that Andy Lund has a little tune before we get going. Okay. If there's a Steve in your phone, you know you'll never be alone. Isn't it good to have a lot of Steves? In your phone. <laughs> Wait, do you do Steve, famous, famous Steves in your phone like all the time? Not just because I'm on it, right? No. Is it all, is it I've wanted Steve? to do this episode for quite a while, <laughs> or this uh, segment for quite a while. Uh, we had another guest. Um, um, well, I've been trying to hook up getting um, the professional skateboarder Steve Caballero on here, and we were going to play Famous Steve. So it ha the guest has to be named Steve. To oh, play okay, famous Steve, okay. uh, my father-in-law's name is Steve, but he's famous, and in my opinion, I, I love him to death. So maybe he's watching. But there you go. So Steve, all right. So Steve, let's go. Let's not do Stevie Salas first. Let's do Tim. Are you going to join in on Famous Steve's? Come on, play it. I, well, I, I well, yeah. I guess I have no choice. You Come have on, no you're choice. Play you're Famous not, Steve. You're not his relations guy. You gotta yeah. Okay. So. Okay, Famous Steves. Uh, pull up your phone and look at Famous Steves. Well, uh, I could go first. You want me to go first? I'll go first. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Steve Aoki. Uh -huh. I got Steve Aoki. Okay. Uh, Steve Caballero. I just said that. Um, Steven Matz. Steven Matz is a professional baseball player. Uh, and uh, Steve, Stevie Salas. Hey. That's it. That's it. Okay, I don't have a ton of Stevie. Stevie Steve Stratos. That's my my father-in-law. We'll throw him in there in famous Steve. <laughs> All right. Okay. Who's next? You want to go? I'll Who's go. Who's next? You go. I got Steve Poltz. 
Oh, cool. that's a good one. That's San Diego one, boy. Right? Yep. San Diego boy. Yeah. I've got Steve McCreary, Colleen's guitar. He's famous. Yeah, he's famous. Austin, Austin, Austin Texas. Okay. Austin yeah. guy. Yeah. You just connected me now. I'm in Austin. I live in Austin yeah. in San Diego. Yeah. And yeah. there you go. It's pretty cool. I've got Steve McMinn from Pacific Rim Tonewoods. Mm-hmm. It's famous and, to us. And, um, I guess my last famous guy would be Steve Samansky, who runs Planet Bluegrass. There you uh, go. In Lyons, Colorado. I, I also have Steve Padula from the band Thursday. I, I forgot. He was buried underneath. Okay, so I'm adding that. Okay, okay. Uh, Mike, you go. This is kind of disappointing on the Steve front. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, I have Steve Theralt, who is our business <laughs> intelligence <laughs> manager. We all have Steve Theralt on there. And, yes, uh, he's yeah, he's on great. speed he's dial. Great. And then uh, I'm uh, Stephen Alex Skolnick, or did I just make up the fact that his first name is Stephen, which it's not? So <laughs> I, don't, right. I literally have three Steves in my phone, and the last one is a Stevenson. So I mean, it doesn't <laughs> look, yeah. really... look at what text wrote. Text is a good gonna, one. Hey, I was going to say Alex Skolnick's been a friend of mine for a long time. He never told me his name was Steve. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he is in my phone. So if we do famous Alexes, I, I'm I, I can play. There you go. There you go. <laughs> There you go, John. John's got one. All right. All right. All right, Tim, it's your turn. And then we're going to get to Stevie. See if you can win this whole game show we're calling primetime. Okay. All right, your turn, well, Tim. number one is Stevie Salas. Hey, yeah, baby. Hey, hey, hey. Come on. All right. I like uh, it. I like it. Steve Vai. Oh. Steve Howe. Oh. Uh, Steve Stevens. Ooh. Love That's Steve a- Stevens. I think you mentioned him earlier, too. I mean, He's a, just the greatest, the greatest yeah. ultimate rock star, cool guy in wakes up like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Steve Lukather. Mm. Good. Very good one. Uh, that's Steve. Well, never Steve Miller is in there. No, 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 guy, Steve oh, Miller. Miller. Oh yeah, just super. It's not like I go out for coffee with these guys. I, mean, Steve, I know, but my it's my phone book. It's called Famous Steves, man. Right. Uh, <laughs> We're not asking you for the numbers. Steve Stephen Curtis Chapman. Uh-huh. Oh, that's a good one. There you yeah. go. Uh, there you go. Okay. All right, Tim's uh-huh. winning. Yeah, t- <laughs> Tim. Winning. Tim may have this round. You know what? If your artist relations guy isn't winning and you're at a guitar company, you got to get a new <laughs> artist relations guy. Those yeah. guys got to know all the rock stars. Yeah, he's definitely winning Truth. this one. All right, yeah. Stevie, Stevie Salas, yeah. it is your turn to play right, Famous Steves. Okay, I just pushed S-T-E-V without any of the rest to stop any Steve in, Steve, or Stevies. So I got Steve Stevens. Okay. Uh, Steve Jones. Uh, Steve, Blu- Steve Blucher from Jam- Demarzio. Oh, Pickups. Demarzio, that's right. Yeah. Uh, Steve Ferroni, the outstanding drummer from Tom Petty and Heartbreakers, and everybody Great else. Uh, Steve Steve Luke up there. Uh, who else was he? Uh, Steve Vai, drummer Steve Wolf that plays with Eurythmics. Oh yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, Steven Tyler. Oh. Uh, There's Steve that. Stevie Van Zant. Oh. <laughs> uh, let me see who else is there. That that might be all of them. You know, I think that I think that's all of them. <laughs> this fight's been called. It's a TKO. The winner <laughs> and still champion, Stevie Salas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's so good. Oh man. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have trivia tonight. We're not doing two minutes of sports because we just wanted to hang out with Stevie and hear these wonderful stories and and get some dialed in inspiration, as we say. Man, Stevie, you've been so fantastic joining us. Everybody, go Mm. check out Rumble. Just go check out Rumble. It's It's on on Netflix, man. It is on Netflix. Um, Just dial it up. Type it in there. Search Rumble. Um, The first thing you hear is the first chords the first riff of that rumble of link ray's rumble song right and it's just man it's well done i love it so much thank you so much for hanging out with us tim godwin oh, wait hold on jay hold on jay i just got, He's a got text. more steves i just got a text from a friend in tokyo my friend ute and she says oh did you get a new dog she's hearing your dog mike and she thinks i got a new dog <laughs> <laughs> That's you can awesome. borrow them if you want. 
you know, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't charge much for rent. You know, it's all good. <laughs> That's so funny. I, we do have, all right. All right. Here's one. Here's one. We do have a question from the feed that I'd like to ask before we have Andy Lund close this thing out. And that is, do you have a Prince story? Yeah, I got a couple of them. Okay. So, <laughs> All right, round. Okay. What is this? Seven okay. now. Hey, okay. I'm, not gonna, okay. I'm just going to. This is not the story, but just so you know, Rhonda, Rhonda Smith called me one time and said, "Look, we're, we're having a hard. We're putting, putting together. Prince wants an all-girl band. We're, we're having a hard time finding a guitar player, and I'm trying to convince him to have you. And you want me to come play in Prince's all-girl band? Okay, so that didn't happen. So Rhonda <laughs> Smith did. But Rhonda Smith did call me for that. But one time I was uh, in the early 1886, 87. I went to a party at this place called Vertigo in L.A. And Prince was playing it for his birthday afterwards with Sheila E. and everybody. And I was with an actor from the TV show Fame called Jesse Borrego. And so Prince wanted to meet Jesse. And he, I wasn't nobody yet. I played with P-Funk and that's about it. And uh, Prince came over to meet us. And when I went to shake, sh shake his hand, it felt like a, a cup of warm butter. It kind of grossed me out. That was my Prince story. <laughs> it was all, <laughs> and it was just squishy. And I was like, oh, my God. You know, but, I mean, but he was a genius. Don't get me wrong. Now all I can think about is warm butter. It was yeah. like squishy. It was all squishy. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, hi, Roger. Bye, Roger. Mike, it's been always. It's great. You guys, next week is a pre-recorded episode. Please jump in. We'll be in the chat hanging out with you guys. But a bunch of us are traveling next week and doing some stuff. I'll actually be on the East Coast uh and i'll and, be with you and you will be with me and we're we're capturing some content but um again stevie thank you so much for joining lund it is always fantastic to see you my friend how about you take it away yeah <laughs> what was it what was it it was prime time it was prime time what the heck was that well that was prime time prime time stevie says your brain changes rock bottom sounds different these days Last child was an early jam he learned. He probably knows how to walk this way. <laughs> he had so many stories to tell. Rod Stewart told him to never stop. He can dance between the black and white, but it's all about the rock. Things you learn on prime time. Prime time. On Tuesdays. Good night, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stevie. Good to see you, man. Thank you guys so much. It's so much fun. Good to see you. Thanks, Stevie. Thanks, Stevie. Bye. All right, everybody. We'll see you next week, and we'll be live the week after that. See you again. Bye, everyone.